And welcome to everybody watching. I'm Jason Gotts with Big Think, and this Hangout is brought to you by Big Think Mentor, our lifelong learning platform on YouTube for personal and professional growth. I'm here with Ellen Galinsky, president of the Families and Work Institute and author of Mind in the Making. She's here to talk about the seven essential life skills that are the subject of her book and her workshop for Big Think Mentor. Welcome, Ellen. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Jason. It's a real pleasure. And I'd also like to welcome three members of our Big Think Mentor community, um, Christian Grieco, and please correct me if I say your name wrong, uh, Nicholas, uh, oh, actually, Nicholas Anhorn couldn't be with us, um, and Patrick Johnson. Welcome, guys. Thank you for having us. Okay, so I'd like to start us off with a question uh, for Ellen. And so there was a big article this week in New York Magazine, which I'm sure you saw, on the negative power of praise. Um, and it's one of many such articles I've seen recently. Uh, American parents tend to focus on boosting kids' self-esteem. Um, and maybe Western parents generally, but the research of psychologist Carol Dweck and others suggests strongly that overpraise can actually demotivate kids, making them reluctant to work at things that don't come so easily to them, so they give up more easily. Um, how seriously should parents, teachers, and even employers take this mess message or these findings? Uh, should we be going back to the days when teachers followed the maxim, no smiling before Christmas? Um, is, you know, is that is that, you know, is it that serious and that uh, substantial? Uh, as Carol Dweck says, we have been through the self-esteem movement and she did a survey and found that the large majority of parents believed that the way that you boost kids' self-esteem is by praising them. But it's not that it's praise per se that's bad, it's the kind of praise that, that really matters. Um, most parents and most of us play, praise personality. We praise character. We say you're really smart or you're a good artist. Or, mm -hmm. um, and we don't praise the things that motivate us to try harder, to try that, that next challenge, to take on a challenge in, in the mind and the making uh, view that, that this is one of the important life skills. If we praise both adults and children's effort, you tried really hard or you did uh, this particular, uh, use this particular strategy, um, that is we praise strategies, um, then, then kids, then adults will, will work hard, will stay motivated. Um, and I've, there's also research that says that, um, that the, that the praise, um, whether you give very specific and concrete praise or larger global praise also matters. That is, if you're trying something that's a real challenge, um, then talking about very specific first steps that an adult might take uh, tends to be more motivating. Not, I'm going to lose weight, but I'm going to lose five pounds. Um, so that also matters um, in terms of how we talk to people and how we talk to ourselves. Great. Um, <clears throat> now I'd like to open the floor um, to Christian and, and Patrick, and, and we'll just go round robin. Christian, if you could ask one question, and then Patrick, and then we can go back to Christian and Patrick and do two questions each that way, and then great. we'll, we'll great. take it from there. Thanks, Jason. I want to thank Big Think and, and Alan. This is a great opportunity. It's a very exciting to have the opportunity to speak direct with you and you hear your insights. Uh, the first question I had, Alan, was in skill number three, communicating. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that employers are reporting that communication uh, is a uh, critical skill that the younger workforce is, is lacking. Um, is there a particular cause that you see for why that's the case in the workforce? Um, we ask an open-ended question of a nationally representative sample of employers in the research that the Families and Work Institute does, mm -hmm. and way by and large they said that um, young people, new entrants to the workforce, um, are not very good at both oral and written communication. And I think that it's because we don't teach people to communicate, in mm -hmm. a sense. Um, you can easily blame, blame you know, the, the Twitter world and the fact that we're not really talking face-to-face -face, uh, for this, and, and I'm sure that that has a part in, in how we communicate. But we need to um, 
teach people what I would think of as the elevator speech. That is, think about if you have a limited amount of time to communicate, one, what do you really want to say? And then two, and this would involve the skill perspective taking, how do you say it in a way that it can be heard? And that how do you say it in a way that it can be heard, we're not teaching ch children, we're not teaching adults um, how to do that. Um, my daughter got a whole master's in strategic communication. She spent, you know, two and a half years at Columbia uh, because she runs a nonprofit philanthropy that funds social entrepreneurs. And she finds that the entrepreneurs that they fund, they started Teach for America, City Year, etc. She finds that the entrepreneurs who succeed are the ones who are good communicators. And although they may have a big, bold idea to, uh, as social entrepreneurs that can solve a really tough problem, if they don't know how to communicate it well, then they don't necessarily succeed. So she felt that in her job as co-running this organization uh, called Echoing Green, that if she could help uh, their grantees learn to communicate better, they would um, be able to achieve their goals in much better ways. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, Patrick. Uh, my first question was on um, perspective taking. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, about how we live in such a competitive world. How does empathy or emotional intelligence lighten competition? Well, it's interesting. Uh, that's a great question because um, in some ways we, we live in a very competitive world and yet in the business world it, the, the, end of, the era of the individual hero, I think, is gone. That is, we can't just depend on the Jonas Salt to come up with a polio vaccine. It's going to take a team. Mm -hmm. And uh, the smart employers, I think, are building in team competencies, not just individual competencies, where the chemist and the physicist or, um, or the biologists, if you're talking about prevention of disease, have to figure out how to work together. And so um, I think that teaching the skill of perspective taking is critically important. Now, it's different than empathy. It involves empathy, which is I feel what you feel. Um, it's um, in, emotional intelligence is, in a sense, a good concept because it involves intelligence. It's social, emotional, and cognitive competencies and it helps you understand the perspectives of others. And I can give an example. Um, I always think of, of um, Admiral Michael Mullen, who was the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And when he, uh, and he was quite successful in his job, I think, at least I feel he was, um, when he talks about what helped him go into a, uh, into a country like Afghanistan or Iraq or Iran, he didn't do the usual, here's the history, here's the geography, uh, here are the key facts that you need to know. What he tried to understand is how people fr who grew up in that culture would think. And that really helped him uh, succeed. Or you think of medical school. Um, there is re the cost, I read in the New York Times today, that the cost of health care is going up and it keeps going up. One of the ways to control the cost of health care is to improve patient-doctor communication. That involves perspective taking. So medical schools are increasingly um, asking um, future candidates, they're rating future candidates on whether or not they can uh, listen to the patient, understand the patient's own view of his or her symptoms, um, and then communicate back so that there's a back and forth communication. And um, that's, they found that is one way that they can really control costs. Um, uh, to reduce our, you know, to reduce the the uh, price of healthcare as it escalates in this country. So, I think that the notion of the competitive world as an industrial era. Yes, of course we're we're very competitive. Yes, of course I want my organization to 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 win to succeed, um, and I'm sure all of us want to on an individual level. But we can do that best by working with other people, not by um, you know putting them down and pushing them off to the side of the road. Thank you. Great, and back to Christian. Well, thank you. And it, it, it seems this, this, these skills just seem so fundamental, right? <laughs> These baseline fundamentals that they're, it's ironic that we're forgetting about them. It's not like this is not like new stuff at all. No. Um, it's 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 you know to your point as where the industrialization has uh, you know ha has happened that you're, you know you know I'm in the technology world. It's so easy to think well technology is is the solution. 
but without the people and without the communications that you speak to, technology is uh, is worthless. Okay. It, won't, it won't make things better. In fact, mm -hmm. you know, I, I deal, you know, you know, obviously in the marketplace with a lot of things. I was doing it yesterday, and just counting on computer screens to have all the right information doesn't have the interaction happening. You don't get the social aspect to it, and you don't get people to help because, well, the computer screen just says this, so therefore I'm on to the next customer. Uh -huh. You're missing the fundamentals. Exactly. I mean, it does seem that these skills are obvious, and yet I spent, uh, I, I, I was, went into what became Mind in the Making. I didn't start out to write a book. I didn't start out to do something called Mind in the Making. I started out with a real question, which is what do we do to children to turn off the fire in their eyes? All children are born engaged in learning. It's a survival skill. Um, our brains are, of all uh, other beings in, in um, the world, our brains are less developed at birth than any other species, hmm. so we have to, um, we depend on the environment to write the script for our genetic codes, in a sense, if you want to use a technology analogy. So, so much of who we become and what we are comes from the experiences we have after we were born. In fact, uh, they're calling the first three months of life the fourth trimester these days because mm -hmm. so much uh, is happening during that time. I could see across disciplines that there are these skills that, that are emerging, mm -hmm. and yet most schools, most classrooms, most parents don't promote these skills. And so it's, it's like hidden in plain sight. It's obvious, but we're not paying attention to it. Um, in a fundamental um, way, and but when you know it, when you think about it, then it becomes obvious. So the way that I came up with seven and seven seems like, oh yeah, good publishing number. Did you just come up with seven because <laughs> your publisher said that would be a good number? Right. Um, no, I mean what I really did was to take <clears throat> what I was seeing in the research from neuroscience, from cognitive science, from developmental psychology, etc., mm -hmm. um, and look at where there were longitudinal studies what had happened in that child's life um, to help that child thrive now and in the future. And that's how the seven skills actually emerged. In a sense, the seventh skill is kind of cumulative, which is self-directed, engaged learning. It kind of pulls them all together. And focus and self-control, the first skill is, is a baseline, um, in a sense, because if you can't pay attention, you can't really learn the other skills. If you don't have the self-control to not go on automatic, then you can't yeah. really learn to listen to what someone else says, for example, with perspective taking. Right. Um, but, um, you know, the response to Mind in the Making has been so much more than I ever expected because these are obvious, but they're hidden in plain sight but they're so simple to do something about. I mean, we can teach these to adults, we can teach them to children, we can promote them in ourselves, um, and it can make a big difference in our lives. Uh, if, if I can in, in interject before we take it over to, um, to Patrick again, you know, one of the things, Ellen, that I like <clears throat> most about what you're saying in the book and in the, the mentor workshop um, is that the seven essential life skills basically, you know, which are the skills that we need to be fully functional, successful human beings basically come down to learning as a life, like an, a lifelong orientation toward learning. They enable us to learn. They, they, you know, they make us effective learners. And and it sort of represents human beings as learning beings throughout the lifespan, which is something that, I mean, on the, there, are, you know, two things. One is we tend to think of learning as something that stops when you graduate from graduate school. I mean, not, not, you know, in some ways no, but in some ways yes. Like, I'm done my learning and now I'm doing my life. Um, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and, and so the idea of that, that you're learning throughout your life is not something that people necessarily actively engage in, you know, um, uh, past school. And then, you know, secondly, we always have this back and forth where on the one hand we understand that it's good for children to be curious and that we want them to be active learners you know, in education and designing curriculum and so forth. And on the other hand, um, we have these exigencies of skills and so forth that we feel we have to teach children concrete things so that they can remain competitive and so forth and so on that often, you know, create curriculums and school systems that do the exact opposite, that, as you say, put out the fire in, mm -hmm. in children's eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, um, 
you know, I wonder kind of what it would take for the orientation of whole educational systems to shift mm -hmm. in, in such a way that we are focusing on these kind of meta skills that make for better learners, you know, not only in sort of progressive schools, but also, you know, everywhere, uh, more than we are on concrete right. you know, skills. No, that is such a great question. I just love that so much because, um, and all of these are great questions, and the reason that I love it so much is that it's, it's like the notion of competitiveness, me against you always right. when none of us are going to, um, you know, do anything that matters without the help of other people in one way or another, whether it's reading a book or actually working with people who um, are our sponsors or mentors or so forth. Um, the notion of learning is a very industrial era um, notion now. Uh, I think of the movie Waiting for Superman, and there's an image in it where I want, well, where I went to myself when I watched it. That is exactly the way we think about learning. Um, this was a school, presumably about education that worked, Waiting for Superman, and yet the image was of a kid whose head was cut off, and numbers and letters and shapes and stuff uh, were poured in. So we have this tabula rasa, this kind of empty vessel will pour in the knowledge notion when everything we know about brain science says that we are active learners. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday I met with an entrepreneur um, who, uh, whose company has made a lot of money and they want to figure out how to improve the educational system because they're not happy with the new entrance to the workforce. And he's trying to learn about education. He's going around the country and figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And he was really discouraged because he thought that most innovation in education depended on the one charismatic leader. And yes, it does if we keep the old model going. But if everyone becomes a learner, then in a, and, and if we're always trying to improve things, then um, we uh, can keep improving education to better fit what we know from science and to better fit what we need in the 21st century. I don't think that I would have seen the skills, honestly, if so much of my work at the Families and Work Institute weren't with um, the adult workforce and workplace. I mean, I just mm -hmm. have, you know, hear that discussion all day long in, in, um, in, a, in the research that we do and in the employers we work with. Um, so one thing that has really gratified me, and I'm sorry if this is a long answer, but you've gotten my, my soapbox here, um, is that we are out now in about 14 communities um, where we have taken the book and turned it into training modules, and, and, they're, and they're really actually, we call them learning modules, not training modules, because training is the old view of <laughs> what learning is, but learning modules. And I've seen that fire come back in adult size. The teachers, the principals, the superintendents, the pediatricians, the social workers, the language therapists, they get excited about learning by going out because we share the actual research. You see Carol Dweck, you know, in live living color doing her studies and talking about what she found in our modules. You have real experiences in learning yourself. And we've seen that have the ability to begin to transform the educational system in ways that, honest to God, I didn't think were possible. Um, but when you get adults excited, when they own the innovation that they need, um, when they base it on science, I think we can begin to reinvent the way we think of think the way we think about um, teaching and learning. Great. Um, I, and Patrick, I'm sorry I jumped in there, but uh, I, I definitely um, you know was sparked by what was going on in the conversation. So go go ahead and please ask your your next question. Definitely. Um, yeah, I agree with you about the way we learn and how it. Uh, how we think about it like socially, cognitively, emotionally, and how, how we can relate that to school and um, within like this cl classroom lectures and independent reading, independent learning, and also like clinical rotation or something where you get hands-on experience. So I can see I can see your point there. Um, I'll go to my next question here. It's on critical thinking. And it was um, how can we generate, how can critical thinking generate positive or negative actions and reactions? Uh, that's a great question, a complicated question. Um, I feel that the world is so awash with information that it's very hard to know what's what's real. I mean, you can watch the same news story on two different channels and to get to totally same event, presumably, 
and you get two totally different interpretations depending on the, the point of view of the commentator and the channels that you've happened to ter turn into, or radio the same, or newspapers the same anyway that we get information about the world that we don't directly experience. Um, and how do we know how to make decisions because our decisions, who we vote for, um, how we live our lives, depend on how we see this experience that where we don't have direct knowledge of it. I mean, we can't, you know, maybe in, in, in a very pre-industrial agricultural world, we could have direct experience with everything that we needed to know about. We can't do that anymore. We have, we have to outsource our knowledge. So I think that by and large, critical thinking is an important skill because it's the, the ongoing search, and the word ongoing is critical here, the ongoing search for valid and reliable information. So you have to understand um, when information is not accurate, when it's what researchers would call confounded because you can't say that A always leads to B. Um, you, you, you know, it's just, it's more complicated than that and um, other things get in there. And so I think um, teaching children not just, let's say, science, but how scientific thinking takes place has been found to um, improve them in all sorts of other areas. I'm thinking of the research that's going on at Carnegie Mellon um, by David Clark, for example. Um, he found that kids um, in the seventh grade, eighth grade, et cetera, were never thought how to conduct a good experiment. They were always told, here's the experiment and here's what it learned, but not how do you know whether it's a really good experiment. And when he actually taught kids how what a good experiment was and how would, how would you know um, what you've learned from this experiment, it made a big difference in, um, in the kids' um, lives and performance. So I think by and large it's mostly a positive result, but of course, um, you know, we get lots of knowledge that it's hard to figure out whether it is reliable and accurate, and I guess that's the bad side of it. How do we know with, you know, the thousands of Twitter feeds we get every day what's real and what's not real? Definitely, and I think that's what kind of drew me to Big Think is um, when I'd independently learn for myself, I'd go, I'd use like databases through school and like go after research-based articles, and there was a bunch of information, you know, a bunch of different articles, a bunch of different places to draw this information from, and I'm not saying it was a bad way to do it, but um, I like how Big Think takes it into a different perspective and like kind of breaks it down for you and um, helps you understand it in, in terms of your own life and what you're doing, so thank you for that. Well, I'm a total fan of Big Think. When, oh, yeah. when we decided to work together, I was like, I couldn't have been more wildly excited, as Jason knows, because he got my euphoric uh, emails back to him when uh, we started this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that it brings uh, people together in, in a way that we can now with technology. I mean, we can have this conversation. And, you know, you can push back at me, and I love that. And I can hopefully push back at you, and I love that too. We can, have, we can do the big thinking that we need to do uh, to be able to um, live our lives in the way that we want to. Yeah, I mean, we're, um, not to turn this into an extended advertisement for big think, but, <laughs> um, but, you know, having worked here for two years, I, what I like best about it is the fact that you know we can connect with people like you, Ellen, and that now through you know through um, through mentor and things like this hangout, you know we can actually connect directly with our audience uh, in spite of the fact that what we do kind of happens out there on the big impersonal web. And you know in the past we've we've mainly been feeding you know video out to the world. It's 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 amazing now to be able to just. Uh, sit and interact in this way and really kick the ideas around. Um, so I think we've, we've really come uh, to the end of our half hour. Um, and so I want to say thank you to everybody uh, out there in the audience for joining us today. Um, and, and thank you especially Ellen uh, Galinsky for being with us. Um, you've been watching our, our Big Think Mentor Hangout with Ellen Galinsky, who's author of Mind in the Making. Um, and you can visit youtube.com slash user slash bigthinkmentor to view Ellen's uh, video workshop based on her book um, called The Seven Essential Life Skills. Um, and, and thank you so much for being with us uh, also today, Christian and Patrick. Thank you. It's great.
Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure to meet you. You too. Yeah. Definitely, you too.